Selamat siang. In this brief video, we'll add one more concept to our understanding of flip-flop operation, asynchronous inputs. As you might guess from the name, these are inputs that have no regard for the clock. Shown here is the device symbol for a JK flip-flop with asynchronous inputs, named PRE and CLR. Imagine for a second that those inputs were not there. Then, this device would look exactly like the basic JK flip-flop discussed last video. Other types of flip-flops like D and T can also have these inputs, but we'll just look at the JK example here. As indicated by the prime next to the name, and also the bubble on the port, these inputs are active low. When PRE is active with a zero signal, Q is immediately forced to one. PRE is short for preset. That name is a little unfortunate because it sounds like reset, but reset is a synchronous operation that causes Q to equal zero. Make a mental note to not confuse preset and reset. When CLR is activated, also with the zero, then Q is immediately forced to zero. CLR is short for clear. I like this name a little better, but I'm still not completely happy with it. Clear sounds like we are deleting data, but really it is just forcing the flip-flop to zero, and zero is a logic value, as opposed to a lack of value. Perhaps better names are immediate set, and immediate reset, because that describes the resulting Q value and the fact that these operations occur asynchronously. There is no waiting for a positive edge of the clock. Also, these asynchronous inputs override the J and K instructions. For example, if J and K are telling the flip-flop to set, but the clear signal is activated, then Q will equal zero. Only when both asynchronous inputs are inactive does the clock, J, and K inputs matter. This behavior becomes more apparent with an example. Here, we see a lengthy timing diagram because there are so many inputs to this device. There is just one output waveform to complete. The first thing I look for in any flip-flop is whether it is positive or negative edge triggered. This one is positive, so I drew vertical lines down from those clock edges. Next, I look at the asynchronous inputs and notice they are active low. So preset is active at the beginning, which means that Q must equal one for that stretch of time without any regard to the clock or J and K. Similarly, for this brief period near the end, clear is active, which means that Q must equal zero. Having noted that behavior, I know that the asynchronous are inactive the remainder of the timing diagram, so I can focus on J and K. Q equals one up through the end of this segment here. Once preset becomes inactive, there is no reason for Q to change. It must remain at its current value until the next positive edge. So I can extend the line to here. Now I see that J equals one and K equals zero. This is set mode, so Q remains at one and will do so at least until the next positive edge. Here, J equals zero and K equals one. This is the instruction for reset, so Q drops to zero. At the next clock cycle, J and K are both low, which means no change. So Q remains at zero. At the next clock cycle, J and K are both high, which means toggle. Therefore, Q switches state from zero to one. The next enabled instruction is reset. So Q drops down to zero again. After that comes a set instruction. So Q jumps up to one. This is where it gets interesting again, because of the upcoming asynchronous clear. 
Q will remain at its current 1 until that clear is activated, at which point Q immediately drops down to 0. This is the only change in this whole waveform that does not occur on one of these vertical lines. After the clear, Q remains low until the next positive edge. Here, the instruction is set, so Q equals 1, and that takes us to the end of the timing diagram. Let's see how close I got in my doodles to my pre-made completed diagram. Not too shabby, but not perfect. This was a bit of a rough sketch. If you are doing this by hand, I recommend using a straight edge to line everything up. Also notice that I wrote in the flip-flop modes underneath this waveform. That is a helpful strategy for drawing it correctly. Studying the flip-flop characteristic tables and drawing out the waveforms might feel a little tedious right now. What's the point? Why do we care about the squiggly line? It is primarily to help us understand how a flip-flop operates. Soon enough, we will turn the process around to design some useful machines. When designing sequential circuits, we say, here's the Q output that we want. What are the instructions to make it do that? 